Use move semantics to control memory ownership and performance. It solves the problem of copying data when we don't actually need to. Before C++11 introduced move semantics, standard C++ code had to rely heavily on copying data. This often meant that systems were doing unnecessary work and wasting computer resources. Consider this function. It returns a vector of strings by value. Without compiler optimizations like return value optimization, this operation is really slow and hurts performance. Inside this function we have a local object named data. This vector manages a dynamic resource. The vector itself lives on the stack, but the data it holds, so the array of 1000 strings, lives on the heap. Since we are using a vector of strings, there are two layers of memory allocation happening here. First, the vector allocates memory for its own list. Second, std string is also a container, so every single string inside that vector allocates its own separate memory for its characters. So with 1000 strings, we don't just have one block of memory, we have the vector's block plus 1000 individual blocks for the strings. This is what we call a deep structure. When the function returns, the data needs to go to the caller. By default, C++ copies the value. To get data into my data variable, the program allocates a new vector buffer and then iterates through all 1000 strings, allocating new memory for each one and copies every character. After the copy is done, the original data variable is destroyed and deallocates its memory. Effectively, we build the object, copied it, and then immediately deleted the original object. Move semantics allows us to skip this copy and simply transfer the pointers to the new variable. Let's look at this explicit assignment. When we write destination equals to source, we call the copy constructor. This constructor guarantees that the original object, the source, remains unchanged. After the assignment, source still holds all its data, which means destination had to create a completely new, independent copy of that memory. This default behavior makes sense because we usually expect variables to keep their values. However, sometimes we know we won't use a variable again. If we could tell the compiler that source is about to be discarded, it wouldn't need to copy everything. Instead, it could just transfer the internal pointer from the source to the destination, and then set the original pointer to null. This is what a move operation does. To make this happen, the compiler needs a way to tell the difference between objects we want to keep and ones that are temporary. That leads us to value categories. In C++ every expression has a value category. The two you need to know are L values and R values. Historically speaking, these names came from the left and right sides of an assignment. But today it is better to think of them as identity versus contents. X is an L value. The simplest way to spot an L value is to ask yourself. Can I use the reference operator to get its address? Since getting the reference of X is valid code, it is an L value. It has a name, a specific memory location, and it remains in memory after this line finishes. Since the variable has a name, we can just steal its data. The compiler plays it safe and assumes that we might need to use that variable again. Now look at the number 10. You cannot take the address of 10. It has no name and no persistent memory location. This is an R value. The same applies for x plus y. The result is a temporary integer. It exists just long enough to be assigned to w and then it is destroyed. Since you cannot take the address of x plus y, it is also an R value. This distinction is how move semantics works. If something is an L value, we have to copy it to be safe. If it is an R value, Value, we know it is a temporary and about to be destroyed, so we can safely transfer its resources instead of copying. C11 added the double ampersand syntax. This is an R value reference, and it binds specifically to temporary objects. When we pass A, the compiler sees a named variable with an address, so an L value. When we pass 5, the compiler sees a temporary value, so an R value 
and it prioritizes the double ampersand version. This tells the function that the value it received is temporary and won't be needed later. While moving an integer doesn't save performance, this same mechanism tries std vector and std string. They use two constructors, and one taking double ampersands for moves. They automatically choose the most efficient operation. To truly understand move semantics, we need to look at a class that manages its own memory directly. This class called memory block is a simple wrapper around a row pointer to an array. The data pointer tracks ownership. Whichever object holds this address is responsible for that specific block of memory. The constructor allocates memory on the heap. This takes time because the operating system has to find a free block of the right size and mark it as used. The destructor handles cleanup automatically. It follows the RAII pattern. So when the object is destroyed, it frees the memory. If we manage this pointer incorrectly during a copy or move, we risk memory leaks. We may also run into double free errors where two objects try to delete the same memory block. Here is a copy constructor. It takes a const reference, which confirms we are copying from an L value, so an object we are not allowed to change. Since we can't modify the source, we can't take its memory. We have to copy it. This line forces us to allocate a completely new block of memory on the heap, which is the expensive operation we want to avoid. Once allocated, we copy the data from the source to the new block. For large amounts of data, this step can be very slow. This is a deep copy. The two objects are completely independent, changing one doesn't affect the other. This is safe, but slow. Here is the move constructor. The double ampersand signature is an R value reference, meaning this function runs only for temporary objects. Crucially, it is not const, because we need to modify the source object to take its resources. This is a shallow copy. Instead of allocating new memory, we just copy the pointer address. This operation is instant, no matter how big the data is. Now we must set the source pointer to null. If we don't, the temporary object's destructor will delete the memory we just took. So then when our new object is destroyed later, it will try to delete the same memory again. This is what's called a double free and it may cause crashes. Setting the source to null pointer ensures that its destructor does nothing, completing the ownership transfer. Always mark move constructors as no except. Standard containers like std vector check for this. If your move constructor might throw an exception, the vector will play it safe and copy instead, causing you to lose the performance benefit. Let's look at how we use this. When we create block 2 from block 1, in this line block 1 is an L value, so it has a name. The compiler sees this and calls the copy constructor. So we get a second memory allocation, and block 1 remains valid. Now let's take a look at block 3. We want to move block 1 into it. However, block 1 is still a named variable, an L value. The compiler won't automatically use the move constructor. It avoids assuming that you are finished with block 1. To enable this move, we have to be explicit. Stud move doesn't actually move anything or generate complex code. It's just a cast. It converts block 1 from an L value to an R value reference. Essentially, it tells the compiler to treat block 1 as if it were a temporary object that is about to be destroyed. Because std move returns an R value reference, the compiler now sees a match for the move constructor we wrote. It calls the constructor, steals the pointer, and sets block 1 to null. After this, block 1 is in a valid but unspecified state. In our implementation, that means it is empty. However, as a general rule, you should treat a moved from object as empty and not use it again unless you assign it a new value. The move constructor creates a new object from scratch. The move assignment operator updates an object that already exists. The signature is similar. It takes an R value reference, so a double ampersand, and it is marked no except. However, the logic inside adds an extra step. 
First, we check for self-assignment. This protects us in rare cases where we might accidentally try to move an object into itself. This check ensures we don't delete our own data before reading it. This is the main difference from the constructor. Since this object already exists, it might already hold memory. We must free the existing memory first to avoid a leak. Once the old memory is freed, the process is the same as the constructor. We copy the pointer from the source. Then set the source pointer to null and return this pointer to support chain assignments. Now let's look at perfect forwarding. Imagine a generic wrapper function whose only job is to pass an argument to another function. It needs to be transparent. If we pass an R value, process should receive an R value. Here we use T double ampersand. In a template context, this is called a forwarding reference. It is special because it can bind to any type of argument. If we pass 10 an R value, the compiler deduces arg as an R value reference. So far the types are correct, but there is a problem inside the function body. We call process arg because arg is a variable with a name, the compiler treats it as an L value. It doesn't matter that it refers to a temporary integer. Strictly speaking, arg itself has a name and an address. As a result, calling wrapper with 10 calls the L value version of process, not the R value version. We have lost the fact that the original data was temporary, forcing an unnecessary copy. To fix this, we use std forward. While std move blindly casts everything to an R value, std forward is conditional. It checks the template type t to see how the variable was originally passed. It works like this. Cast this to an R value only if the original argument was an R value. If t is an L value reference, std forward does nothing, passing arg along as an L value. But if t indicates an R value, std forward casts it back to an R value. This preserves the original type. So calling wrapper 10 now correctly calls the R value version of process. This is a practical example of using vector and place back. It uses a parameter pack to accept any number of arguments of any type. It uses std forward to pass those arguments exactly as they were received directly to the constructor of the new object. This shows why in place back is efficient. With push back you create a temporary object first, which is then moved into the vector. In contrast, in place back takes the row arguments and constructs the object directly. In its final location in memory, skipping the temporary step entirely. Now that we have move operations, we need to see how they fit with the rest of the class. This brings us to the rule of 5. The rule is simple. If your class needs a custom destructor to manage a resource, like a pointer or file handle, you should implement all five special member functions. Here is why this matters. If you write a custom destructor or copy constructor, the compiler stops automatically generating the move constructor. It assumes that since you have complex cleanup logic, the default move behavior might be unsafe. If you don't explicitly define the move operations, your class will silently fall back to copying. You might think your code is moving data, but the compiler will fail to find the move constructor and use the copy constructor instead. To avoid this performance penalty, always define all five. After this line, s is cast to an R value, and its internal data is moved into the text argument inside process. What is left inside S? The standard says a moved from object is in a valid but unspecified state. Valid means the object is not broken. You can safely destroy it or assign a new value to it. Unspecified means you cannot rely on what data it holds. For std string, it is usually empty but for other types, it might contain leftover data. While this might work for std string, logically you should treat S as if it were uninitialized. Do not read from it or append to it. The best practice is to either assign it a completely new value or simply let it go out of scope. This is a very common mistake. You might think moving a local variable here saves a copy. 
but it actually hurts performance. C++ uses an optimization called named return value optimization. When you return a local variable normally, the compiler constructs the object directly in the caller's memory. This eliminates both the copy and the move completely. It is zero overhead. By writing std move, you change the type to an R value reference. This forces the compiler to skip the optimization and call the move constructor instead. You are taking a zero cost operation and turning it into a low cost operation. This rule is simple. Never move a local variable in a return statement. Just return the variable name. The purpose of an R value reference is to modify the object so we can transfer its resource. If you mark it, you are creating a contradiction. You are saying the object is temporary, but you are also forbidding any modifications to it. Here the move constructor requires a modifiable, so an unconst reference to work. Since it can't use the move constructor, the compiler falls back to the copy constructor. This defeats the entire purpose of move semantics. If you see const t double ampersand in a function signature, it is almost certainly a mistake. If you get value out of this deep dive into move semantics, do me a favor and check out the rest of the channel. We are building a massive library of modern C++ programming content and your support really helps keep it going. I've put a video on the end screen that I think you will find useful. Click that if you want to keep going. Thanks for watching.